Welcome to our webinar today. Um, this is Sharing Science on LGBT STEM Day. Uh, my name is Shane Hanlon. I'm part of the Sharing Science program. Uh, so briefly, we'll do some uh, quick kind of overview about who we are if you're not familiar with us. So, the uh, Sharing Science program is a part of the American Geophysical Union, and we are a Society of Earth and Space Scientists. Uh, we're located, uh, we are currently in D.C. Uh, we have 60,000 plus members, and within AGU uh, is the Sharing Science program, and our whole goal, mission, uh, our ideal is to provide scientists with the skills, tools, trainings, opportunities, whatever they might want, uh, need, any way we can help them to communicate scientists to literally any audience. So from non-science public to members of the press to friends, family, neighbors, to other scientists, to politicians, anyone they want to communicate to, we can help with that. And we do this through uh, a variety of different ways. You're on one of them right now through webinars. Uh, our bread and butter are our workshops. Um, but not everyone can come to a workshop at a certain part of the country. So we have a lot of other remote resources and ways we do this other than webinars. Um, we are online. We are on Twitter. We're very active on Twitter. And then we also just provide um, outreach opportunities in areas uh, depending on what you feel, what part of the country, and also just hands-on support. And even though we are part of AGU, we provide our services for literally any scientist who wants it. And so um, my name, like I said, is Shane Hanlon. Uh, we also have, uh, I have in the room with me Kelly McCarthy, who's part of our Centennial program. And then on the phone is also Olivia Ambrosio, who's also part of Sharing Science. And so uh, this webinar is part of our um, Centennial series webinars. I'm going to let Kelly talk about that for a brief moment. Sure. Thanks, Shane. Hi, everyone. Um, this is uh, Kelly McCarthy. And so I just want to share a little bit about AG's Centennial. This year, um, we are celebrating 100 years of advancing Earth and space science um, through a variety of ways. Um, so our mission for Centennial is to broaden and deepen engagement within and outside the Earth and space science community. Um, and we're doing that by offering support through, through grants, by leveraging the community that already surrounds International Science Days and anniversaries. And so our, our work with this webinar, and in particular, uh, looking at um, ways to amplify our scientists' voices um, for LGBT STEM Day is, is one part of that overarching goal. Um, and we'll share resources um, in our follow-up about ways that you can apply for support if you're doing anything or hosting any events, particularly for LGBT STEM Day or for other science days and anniversaries coming up throughout this year. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, of course. So, uh, so that's our brief kind of like we are AGU and this is why we're here type thing. But today we are uh, very fortunate to have uh, two experts who's going, who are going to, oh no, um, who are going to talk about uh, uh, their experiences. So we have um, Rob and Lisa, and I will let them uh, just introduce themselves and get to it. Oh, Lisa. Lisa um, <laughs> audio not connected. Yeah, Lisa, can you try now? We, I swear we did this. This worked a second ago. Um, Rob, why don't you introduce yourself and we'll try to figure out um, Lisa. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Ulrich. Uh, I'm a... I'm finishing up my second year of my PhD in biogeochemistry uh, here at UCLA, and I'm also the founder of Queers in STEM, uh, also based here in Los Angeles. So, yeah, <laughs> is Lisa back? Um, so while we get that all figured out, um, I guess I wanted to talk about since we like usually are pretty like somber, but whenever we're talking about any sort of underrepresented group in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and so- Wait, do we have Lisa? Do we? 
Oh, I have a yes. green phone beside her. Hey! <laughs> We're nimble. Keep going, Rob. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> All right. You don't want to introduce yourself? <laughs> I forgot. I got so flustered. I'm Lisa Gromlich. I am. I serve as the Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington here in Seattle. I am a AGU board member, and I am a paleoclimatologist. I use tree rings to reconstruct climate, and I'm really happy to be on this webinar with Rob. <laughs> Back to you, Rob. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, so I sent out a tweet on Twitter uh, like a few weeks, I guess a week or two ago, asking what other people thought about like, so like sort of flipping the script and talking about like, what is, what are like the good parts about being queer in STEM? Um, and so I think the number one most common one that people were saying is we have a great community um, and it is so supportive and it is so diverse and it is so easily it is so easy, I don't know if it's easy to find us, but once you do find us, it's like just, it's so inclusive and welcoming and it's great. Um, so I don't know if Lisa, I guess Lisa, did you wanna add anything? Rob, you know what, that comes up for me so often and it's both the sort of diversity sort of within the sort of STEM community, but also, you know, I don't know about you, Rob, but I find being queer, it means that when I'm looking for sort of social connections, I end up traveling in really diverse kinds of circles that many of my science colleagues really just don't sort of move in. And so whether it's artists or activists or um, blue collar workers or just, you know, a variety of people in different economic circumstances, et cetera, that when, when you're moving in the gay and lesbian community, you know, it, it gives you, it sort of opens doors to you that, that you might not have otherwise. It's, it's really, it's actually really enriching. <laughs> yeah, like this sort of outsider status kind of forces us to go around and like, like make friends in other places and not get so like, deep in our own work, I guess, and like our own sub-discipline. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what's kind of crazy is, besides just inherently being sort of more fun and interesting, when I think of my career as a professor, having that broader reach out into the community means that when I'm in front of my students and interacting with them, I feel like I have a lot more tools to be able to recognize and see differences with those students and to, to actually hear some of their perspectives and to connect with them. And, and so it's almost like it's professional development as well as fun, you know, that it, it really enriches. I think it has made me a better teacher. Yeah, and I completely agree. And even like beyond, um, I guess, like benefiting ourselves, it's like having the opportunity to like meet other people who are in like maybe social sciences or in like uh i guess for us meeting people who are like in medicine we get to see that how our like research can directly benefit um directly benefit like uh our own communities uh with that breadth in mind so especially in medicine where like we have queer scientists like studying cures for hiv um and that's pretty incredible yeah. You know, I think I think it does just make you even more generally sort of aware of how we exist in community. So, you know, in in my own area, having been studying climate change now for decades, kind of longer than I like to even think about, um, I think it it's made me much more aware of I'm doing science in a social context and wanting to it really motivates me to connect um, not just with your usual rotary club or whatever, you know, that it's, it's how do we actually get our science into the hands of a variety of people. And, and once again, I think it, it tends to sort of really animate us and, and, and make us think about connecting to community in a much sort of broader way. Um, so 
it's it, it's interesting. So one of the things, if I can do a little segue here, um, as the more senior person in this conversation dialogue, one of the things I am so grateful is I feel like there's early career people like yourself, Rob, that have been just much more, quite frankly, brave than I was at your career stage of just being sort of identifying yourself as queer and being out and sort of social media, et cetera. And so how, how the heck did you end up, there you are being a nice graduate student at UCLA and all of a sudden you are the driving force behind Queers in STEM and how'd that happen? I feel like um, it was kind of just like a culmination of different factors that played into how I even got to graduate school in the first place where um, I went to undergraduate at like Virginia Tech, which is like in Southwest Virginia. So it's like almost, it's, I don't want to say the middle of nowhere, but it's like extremely rural. It's in the middle. It's like in a Blue Ridge Valley, if anyone knows where that is. And so I feel like towards the end of um, going through undergraduate there, um, I just started getting, I felt like very lonely and very isolated to a point where I was just like, I can't wait to finish this degree so I can get out of here. Um, and it was sad because I like loved the research there. Um, I eventually found out that like the PhD student I was working with was also queer and that incredibly improved my um, experience. Uh, but yeah, I got to that point where I was just like, so lonely, felt so isolated. And I was like, I just need something to change and I need to get out of here. And then so when I was applying to graduate school, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to go to graduate school, but I was doing it to sort of just keep my um, options open. And so I applied all around um, with probably location being my number one, um, my number one like priority. Uh, and so when I, <laughs> When I found out I got into school like at UCLA in Los Angeles, California, I was so ecstatic. I was like, I'm going to get paid to move to Los Angeles, arguably one of the most queer places in the country. And I'm like getting paid and rewarded to do that and go to school there. And I honestly don't know if I would have gone to graduate school had I not gone into a school that was in such like a great location for queer people. Um, and then when I got here, like sort of building off of that, I went in with this expectation of like, okay, so I'm in Los Angeles, I'm at UCLA, which is one of like the most welcoming uh, places for uh, queer students. And then I went to one of their like, um, the Campus Resource Center for LGBTQ students here is a wonderful. And so they host these like student fairs um, or student resource fairs, which all the different uh, LGBTQ plus organizations uh, table just so that the new students can sort of uh, go to this event and see what's around. And so when I went into that room and saw that there wasn't anything for LGBTQ people in STEM, I was like, I was frustrated. And so I like, I went in and I like took all, like I didn't take all the free cookies. I took like a few free cookies. I took more than one and I just like stormed back out and I emailed them, I was like, how can I make this happen? And luckily they were very supportive and uh, they actually connected me with a few other people who had the same exact idea of starting an organization for LGBTQ people in STEM. And so we all got together and started like just building this thing, um, learning how to like navigate these different like rules and regulations for starting the campus organization. Um, and eventually, some like other things came up for a few of the other people who were sort of building this with me. And so they kind of fell back from like the forefront of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's sort of just how it came to be. And I found it especially easy to, um, I guess like once the 500 queer scientists thing uh, sort of became, I guess, more well known. Uh, and I like caught wind of it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like such an easy way into this like network of LGBTQ scientists, like 
all over the world. And so mm -hmm. I feel like that was just such a, it helped a lot. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and now we're here today. <laughs> So you know what I feel really grateful to you and others is is using that these tools to you know create sort of community and in that community really kind of make it easier for all of us to be out et cetera and I have to admit it it really it's a pretty stark contrast with um what some of my experiences earlier in my career were so in the 1980s, I was very excited because I got a really great assistant professor position at the University of Arizona in Tucson, once again, a pretty welcoming place. And um, early on, I shared with one of the senior administrators in you know, one of those senior administration type buildings, um, you know, that I had a girlfriend and this is a, a female leader and she took me aside and she said, you know, it's, it's okay to be gay, Lisa, but just don't tell anyone. And I can remember kind of feeling like, oh, okay. You know, and she was, she was a very senior leader in the university in which I hoped to get tenure. So I was absolutely in the closet at work. And there's a lot of implications. First of all, you feel really boring. Like people say like, oh, what'd you do this weekend? And you can't like, you know, you have a roommate and you like never say what you really do. Um, and then it just, it just gets painful. Like people make homophobic jokes and you just kind of like kind of withdraw into yourself or, or, you know, there's hate crimes going on and there's assaults and things like that. And you're just like, you're just like completely like sort of shut down. And what I discovered at this incredibly important career stage, here I am an assistant professor and my productivity and creativity is just starting to take a dive. And and I realize it's, it's because at work, I'm just, I'm really tense and I'm not really feeling like I'm part of a community. And a couple of things happened. And finally, I thought, you know what? <laughs> I'm not getting tenure because I'm not getting any work done. You know, like what risks do I have here? And just started coming out and was kind of a little cautious at first and then got much less cautious. And the craziest thing, you know, it, it really was in retrospect that I realized what a toll this had taken on me. And I, I really, I truly do. I have like this year and a half where I like, I didn't publish anything. All of a sudden, my creativity's back. I'm interacting with my graduate students. I'm getting grants. I'm like, you know, I get tenure, I become a dean, you know, whatever. But, but to me, the whole thing that I learned is that if we don't bring our whole selves into our life and work as a scientist, something is missing. And it breaks my heart when I read things like, I think it was the study in Nature that said 47% of the scientists don't feel comfortable being out at work. And when I hear that, it, there's two things. It breaks my heart, literally, because because I live that. You know, what is that toll that that's taking on them personally? But the second thing now, as a dean and as an AGU board member, we need science and scientists to be as productive and creative and connected to each other as possible. And if we don't feel like we can be out, then then science, <laughs> science capital S is suffering. And and it's just not okay. So that's my sort of impassioned like all of you, and it, it's a little weird, Rob, isn't it, to like you're kind of talking, we're talking to each other and we can see each other and there's all of you, whoever you are out there, you know, listening to us, um, you know, please, please do. I hope you, you sort of think about that. Um, and some of the people listening um, could be people that we think of as our incredibly important allies in this. And so how, Rob, I know you've given some thought about how to be an ally. Like, you don't want to be an ally like my 1980s version of an ally, like it's okay to be gay, just don't tell anyone. Um, Rob, do you want to share some thoughts about being an ally? Um, yeah, so let's see if this works. Yay. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. All right. I think that worked. So the, oh, there's that. Oops. So the UCLA LGBT Center, they've, they have a ton of resources on their website, not just for um, queer people themselves, but also 
resources for allies and how to educate your and yeah taking a look at their web pages and poking around uh, you get there are links to so many resources where you can educate yourself on your own identity as well as the identities of other people and how to sort of incorporate like how you act and like live your life in order to like support people and just overall just be more mindful and intentional with everything you're doing um because we talk about these issues in stem but these issues expand way beyond stem too um and so i'm just gonna like sort of read through these uh in case you're on the phone i guess um and so the number like one of the first things is that you can't expect um a person holding these identities to educate like to take the time and energy to educate you on themselves as well as like the struggles that they may have yeah, like it's just it's not their job and it takes a large like mental and emotional energy toll so you should take the time to go out and educate yourself on them um it, uh, an ally would also choose to align with LGBTQ plus people and respond to their needs. So sort of, it's not like this stagnant relationship where you like think you learn uh, what you, you don't just like learn what you find, but then you also go out and practice what you are learning. Um, the third thing is believing that it's in your self-interest to be an ally, so not being an ally because you feel like you have to, but being an ally because you genuinely think it like makes one, you a better person, and then two, it also will benefit people around you and therefore like make the overall community just like improved. <laughs> um, an ally would also be committed to personal growth in spite of probability of discomfort. Uh, so this is sort of important, especially when acting on like being like practicing being an ally, not practicing as in like going to the gym and like um, working on it, but like taking it and using these things that you learn and like all these sensitivity and like inclusivity workshops and actually putting them into practice because it is probably going to feel uncomfortable co uncomfortable for you if you are in this meeting and there's like no other uh, queer or um, trans or queer trans people of color in the room and like you have to be the person to like stand up for like bring those ideas into the room and take them into consideration and make everyone else also think about it um, and that is going to feel uncomfortable and that is probably a good sign um, because it's I've had these conversations with a few of my friends where I've like actually talked uh, with them and it's they're like always wondering how they can be an ally and it's an ally in general not just for lgbtq plus people but it's at the end of the day it's like these things and like issues are not about how you feel it's about how you are making other people feel and so it's sort of just being mindful of what you're doing and the ideas you are spreading um so then the next one would be an ally would be quick to take pride in personal success and responding to homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. So not feeling like after you feel discomfort in practicing this allyship, taking pride in it and being proud of it, being like, I did that. I stood up for people that were not in the room and people that are not in this room because they felt marginalized. And so that's very important to do. And then the last one on this slide is expecting support from other allies because the allies should be supporting each other as much as they are supporting the people that they are allies for. And then continuing, um, allies will also are also able to acknowledge and talk about how patterns of fear have operated in their lives. So I guess another, in other words, it's sort of, acknowledging like being able to acknowledge is the uh, being able to acknowledge the privileges that you have and acknowledge how those privileges that you have have sort of operated in your life as well as the absence of those privileges have operated in other people's lives um yeah 
The next one is that a good ally should expect to make mistakes and then also not use that as an excuse for non-action. It goes again with the discomfort where, yeah, if you are practicing allyship and you make a mistake, don't be surprised if someone like in the community maybe calls you out on it. Don't like, I guess like lash back at them and be like, well, you know, it's like hard for me too. Like, because that doesn't help anyone and it, it shows that it's not really about being an ally. Um, yeah, so just practice it, expect to make mistakes, but then also like keep an open mind to learning more and growing. Cause it, like I said before, it's not a stagnant thing. You're just, you're always gonna be learning more because there's so much to know. And then I guess this might be repeating, but an ally also knows that in the most powered ally relationships, the folks in the non-oppressed role will initiate the change for, towards personal, institutional, and societal justice and equality. And so that just means that like, it's not, at the end of the day, it's not the jobs of the people that are being oppressed to, to like be the force that is driving the change. It should be the allies taking what they practice or taking what they learn in these workshops and how they educate themselves and putting that into practice in what they're doing and really pushing for this, for the change that we all want to see in an inclusive um, field and world. And then, yeah, promoting a sense of community with LGBTQ folks and teaching others about the importance of outreach. So again, I guess feeling that you are a part of this community and then also going out and teaching others in your own personal networks and not like professional networks about the importance of this type of outreach where you're championing championing for people when they aren't there. And then lastly, you have to have a good sense of humor because we have a lot of memes about um, heterosexual people. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's like one of those things where we, um, I don't know. It's like a defense mechanism that we use humor to cover up. <laughs> um, and then there's a link here that you will have access to all these different links um, when we post, share the uh, PowerPoint slides afterwards. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had, yeah. Uh, here are some other resources. Um, these are also from the UCLA LGBT Campus Resource Center. Um, so they have so many links. Uh, so one of the first ones is LGBTQ plus 101. So this tab includes things like the different terminology, what different letters mean, information on neutrosis, which talk, gives you information on um, people who don't identify with the gender or yeah, people who don't identify with uh, the gender binary. And then also different pronouns and how to use them. Then there are also resources for coming out for those that are questioning who are in the closet and then also to educate allies on how to support people who are coming out to them. And then they have a whole separate dedicated like um, tab for queer and trans people of color for about and how to support these people at these intersections because they are the most marginalized out of all of us. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did you have anything to Rob. add? Well, no, Rob, I just love this list. And part of what I'm thinking about is um, when you are a queer scientist and you're at work and um, an ally does something that um, is really well intentioned and doesn't land right, I think, nevertheless, I just love that they're trying. And so, like, like just be aware of um, just showing up and sort of acknowledging the LGBTQ plus people in your lab or in your class, et cetera, is it's just so important. And even if you feel sort of insecure doing it, know that it's like it's just so refreshing to be seen that that you know it's it it's hard, you know, of course mistakes are made, but but there's often I think for us it's seen into the good heartedness of the gesture that, that really is important.
I completely agree. Like, um, just being seen and acknowledged because it is an invisible identity and it's hard to, it's hard to, I guess, visibly show support without action. Um, yeah, and I guess it goes for people in, I guess, like positions of power, I guess, too. Yeah, like um, standing up for these marginalized groups is extremely important. And if they do make a mistake, as because the people, because since we are marginalized, it's like we aren't in these positions of, many of us aren't in these positions of power, where, so it's like, they are going to make mistakes and hopefully allies in these positions are open to feedback and uh, maybe having there be like a dynamic where pro these ideas like progress and develop. Yeah, exactly. Well, Rob, do you think, is this, is it Q&A time? Is or it? Q and Q? <laughs> I think uh, Shane Kelly and I wanted to talk about a few more things, right? <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Hey. No. No worry. No. Yeah. No, we're not. They're not here for me. So <laughs> let me let me just get through a uh, a couple um, uh, final thoughts, and then and then we'll let you two uh, answer questions. So uh, so just uh, so everyone knows, there's a little question box on the side of your toolbar uh, for GoToWebinar. If you have any questions, please throw them in there. We already have a few in and um, we have been trying to answer them as they come in, but we'll collect them and start asking or start answering more. Um, all of the links that you see in there, we've sent some out. They will all be available um, with a follow-up. We'll send everyone a follow-up email that has this archived webinar and then a whole ton of resources. So don't worry if if um, if you can't click on the links. But so so if you want if you want them kind of immediately as we're talking, we'll throw them in the chat box right now. Yeah, yeah, we'll throw them in now and then you'll have them in an email later as well. Uh, but so so what's next? Well, first, um, LGBT STEM Day is uh, the 5th of July. If you are out there um, sharing science, promoting yourself, whatever you might be doing, um, you can use the hashtag, you can add us, you can um, do the HU100 hashtag, and we'll um, promote for you all. We will uh, amplify your voices um, because this is really important to us and we're really excited about it. Um, you can follow us, and there are so many things and ways to follow us. And by us, I mean literally everyone who's on this call, AGU. Um, and again, you'll have this as well for later, and we'll provide anything that Rob and Lisa want to um, have as well, like um, 500 career scientists and everything else. So, um, And then the final thing is this is, is part of the – uh, sharing science program. And again, like I said, our whole um, mission is to help scientists share their science no matter what and to whoever they want, no matter who they are. Um, and if you're interested in that type of thing, we suggest you check out our sharing science network, uh, the sharing science community. Um, it's basically a group of people who are interested in and passionate about science communication, policy, outreach, um, diversity and inclusion, um, basically any sort of issue in science or any sort of aspect in science that's not necessarily like writing your manuscript, um, giving the lecture, but also part of that. So you can check out this link here and, um, and check us out. And with that, it is now Q&A time. Um, so we've had some come in. Um, we've answered some as well. Uh, Kelly, do you have a... Uh, a question for them that they can they can start with as we wait for more to come in. Um, well, maybe we can see. I, I'm not sure if we got this question initially, which was, um, are there first points of contact? There are the resources you shared, Rob and Lisa, that are hyperlinked. But um, if if someone is looking for resources for their students, where should they go first? So one of the oh sorry <laughs> no you go for it <laughs> <laughs> well I was just gonna say you know what we're 
what was great was um, Rob was showing us resources that came out of the LGBTQ Center at UCLA. I know at the University of Washington, there is a Q Center as well. Um, and that at larger, more progressive universities, there tends to be infrastructure like this. The problem is, is that there's smaller, less progressive sort of institutions in places where you may not have this kind of organized research sort of directly on your campus or near your workplace. And at that point, I, I think it's really looking to the kinds of links that are in 500 queer scientists or, or other places that can help you at least find an online community or places sort of in your own community where outside of the university where you can find resources. Rob, do you have ideas about that? No, I think you pretty much hit it on the head where if if your institution like unfortunately doesn't have resources, there are a ton online and um, the online community will definitely support you in any way that you need if we are able to. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, so I know I also just wanna point out, cause I don't know if you both are looking at the, the question box, but I just wanted to share, um, Robert noted as soon as you started talking about the ally section, Rob, um, just that we are here. Um, so I, I think just so that you know that um, we have allies and members of the community in the audience. Um, an, additional an additional question kind of right now for um, Rob, I know you kind of mentioned finding identity and finding community. If um, a group was trying to organize something, particularly for LGBT STEM Day as a starting point, um, is, is there any advice you would offer for um, educators to kind of organize something to start building a long-term community that could provide identity in a space that might not be um, so welcoming right now? Yeah, um, let's see. So actually, I had a slide on it that I forgot to talk about uh, too much, but on that slide, there's a link to a toolkit um, that Shadow Boyle uh, thankfully like put together with some other people. And so in that toolkit, there are links to resources and uh, descriptions to different types of events and different ideas for events that anybody anywhere can do. So things like just like things ranging from just like small meetups and like hanging out with each other all the way up to things that are larger as like uh, I think it's labeled in there as like a cabaret where you have science talks and like also like maybe some drinks and dancing. Uh, so it has a wide range of ideas if anyone is looking for a starting point for something like that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, um, another one where uh, another question you had is. Uh, just, and this might be really big, um, uh, but like how much does your um, identity as being part of the LBGTQ community kind of like influence um, your, say, like interactions out if you're doing an outreach talk to a member, like to folks in the non-science public or you're interacting with media or uh, whatever it might be, because uh, we're like we in sharing science, like our core thing is to help scientists to do all of these things. But I'm just wondering kind of one layer on top of that, like how does this kind of like influence how you see those things through a different lens or, or does it at all? Do you want to go first, Lisa? Yeah, so here's, this is kind of a way meta level answer, but with me here. Um, you know, I think one of the things about being queer in STEM is that you, you're always sort of questioning assumptions and you're always 
um, being aware that, you know, are people sort of understanding sort of your full identity and are you understanding their identity? So in terms of public outreach, you know, if we take a science communication workshop or something, they'll, you know, they'll talk about sort of connecting to people where they're at. And one of the things I feel like this has helped me to do is walk into a room and really have much more sort of open eyes and, and quite honestly, a, a really sort of open heart about like who's in this room and, you know, where, what are, how are their words or their body language indicating that they are more or less leaning into the topic that we're here to discuss? How are they sort of interacting? And it, um, and allows, I feel like it has allowed me to be just a better science communicator because I'm just paying attention. And I'm, as I'm, I've actually never sort of put this together. If you, if you sort of think about what it's like to be queer is you're always kind of walking into a room kind of going, okay, is this going to be a place where I'm going to be safe or not? You know, and you're, you know, you kind of develop this sort of sixth sense about everything that um, whether you like it or not, you know, you, to survive, you have to be emotionally intelligent. And I, and I think it's that um, paying attention to individuals and where they might be at that is, is such a strong skill set that you just end up developing as a survival um, that's, that's really an asset. That makes sense to you, Rob? Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I completely agree. Um, I guess it's also, I guess just building off of that, it's also uh, doing these things sort of, sort of try to use it as a platform, even if it's like a talk at like a conference or like a poster session, I'll probably have like at least some like pin on to signify like, oh, hey, I'm queer um, and I'm like visible. And so hopefully if anyone I guess like hopefully that at least makes me look more um, approachable to someone who might be more like timid and like maybe afraid to talk about those sorts of things or experiences. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I wanna like second the whole, the like connecting with people and uh, using sort of just like these skills and senses that we've been sort of, uh, forced to have to develop um, makes us better communicators and makes us more patient in how we communicate and the different ways that we do. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's all I have to say about it. Yes, thank you, um, both of you for that. So we have uh, another question that just came through. So this is um, from a cis hetero male noting that uh, with his privilege, he keeps bringing up that um, in a more privileged position, um, one is responsible for improving situations of um, folks in underrepresented communities. Um, something that has come up that he is curious about your, if you have advice on how to handle this, is where he, when he receives pushback um, in a specific example from a female person of color, um, where there was pushback against um, kind of this, I, and um, I, I think the the question is kind of like if you receive pushback as um, an intended ally, trying to use your privilege to be supportive, um, how do you navigate this relationship where someone is is not um, receptive of it? Um, are there any strategies or kind of advice for how to navigate? those waters? Yeah, um, so I guess if, I'm assuming the situation where is where you are trying to be an ally for um, a community that this other professor was a part of. Um, and I think probably the most important thing that you want, want to do to help yourself navigate that situation is make sure that uh, you aren't trying to speak for this person or their communities, but try to amplify what they are expressing that their needs are. And so, yeah, I would maybe 
not take it as pushback, but maybe feedback. And then I think if you want to be an effective ally in that situation, you could maybe approach that person and if they have time or the energy, maybe you can ask them how, ha ask them how, like, ask them what they would want you to do or how you can support them and what their goals are. What do you think, Lisa? Thank you, Ron. Can, oh. can I ask you know, one qualifier um, we got about that question? Sorry, that was a, a little bit different than how I asked it. The person um, uh, that was kind of pushing back uh, was, from an underrepresented group, but not a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, so ha I guess the question is a little bit different. Um, oh, well, I think, yes. I think that was probably because I could actually read along in the little chat box. I, I think that was that was pretty clear. And I think Rob's, Rob's answers works. And, you know, I'm, also making the assumption that this might be in a workplace where you're in a department or some kind of larger working group together. And it's interesting because sometimes being an ally involves um, issues, in this case, because it's a, person, a female person of color, it's this issues around gender or race and equity, et cetera. Um, in general, people who are more marginalized often have struggles just having some of their ideas and initiatives supported. And it could be that this person, you know, kind of having a conversation with this person, and it could be that what she really wants is she really wants to reform the way some the 100 level courses are being taught. And it's just feeling like her voice is not being heard. And it could be that, you know, being an ally sometimes means showing up for somebody and sort of helping them navigate the sort of complex politics of our collective work together that um because you know sometimes when you are a more marginalized person you can be saying super smart things and somehow your voice is just not registering out there in the larger politics of the group so um so I think, you know, it's, I think trying to, I think picking up on Rob's themes, which were reflecting a little bit about what really was going on, and then asking questions. Great, thanks all. Uh, another one we have um, is, uh, it's about um, kind of like doing advocacy and um, even just uh, any sort of like science, communication, outreach, policy work outside of your day job. Like how do you avoid burnout? Because we, um, it, it's one thing to do, like we, again, in sharing science with Shane, we come across folks who are just trying to do all these things on top of um, being a professor or an industry or a government or whatever else, that's just from a science communication perspective. And then you're adding another layer. So kind of like what are your strategies to avoid getting burnt out on this? You or me, Lisa. <laughs> um, I am a big, part of what's fun of being a dean is I can actually say these things and then people are arguably supposed to do things because I'm the dean. So I'm a big fan of telling particularly my um, uh, more early career colleagues that, you know, this whole thing is a marathon, not a sprint. And you have got to take care of yourself and you have got to find the balance between your passion for your science, your engagement in advocacy and, and sort of science related work outside of the, the sort of formal workplace and your family and your friends and your own spiritual growth and, and your, your wellness. And tactically speaking, what that means for me is that I actually ask all of my assistant professors to reflect on what is the one most important, highest priority way their scholarship or their science connects with society? And how is it that they would know that they had actually moved the needle in that area? And to just start there and don't try to do everything and to look for sort of gaining resources and skills and capacity to make that one needle move. And 
that's helpful because otherwise, you know, particularly if you get so you you know you kind of get some skills and you get more confident on this, man, your inbox you know explodes with requests and 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 they're all good things and you want to do them all and you can't do them all. You know, you've got to you've got to figure out a way to have some balance and to know that balance is going to be a foundational piece of that is you know you are doing your best bringing your best science to its highest need and concentrating there so that would be my advice yeah and i think as a student it's sort of the same thing where i've actually feel like i've had to learn these lessons very recently where i'm just like I currently know I have way too many things on my plate and now I'm actively trying to take things off because I can, I can feel myself starting to burn out. And I'm just like, cause sometimes I just like wake up and I'm just like, I am so exhausted. Um, and so sort of taking things off my plate and putting them back on one by one, uh, by just, is this, this important to me? Like what are the most important things that I'm capable of doing right now? within within the limits of my own time and energy um and so i do that and then i only work so many hours a day like i will i like time block i don't <laughs> and i hate to like just sort of go back on to like time management but i i time block my time and where i'm like i will work on this from this hour to this hour and then after like maybe like a my work day i reserve like personal time where i'm just hanging out relaxing um and just making sure that i do get the time that i need off um yeah because at the end of the day you have to conserve your own energy and only do what you're capable of um because if you burn out then that doesn't help anyone right um it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the cause that you're trying to um, push for. So, yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, we've got time for one last question. And so we have one about um, advice for incoming undergraduate students, folks just starting out their careers in science. Can you share some advice? Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to interpret the question about is this about how to establish yourself as an incoming student or is it I guess because it's the it's the, our webinar, it must be about being a gay, lesbian, trans, queer, undergraduate. I guess yeah, find I think that um and there's um that that is I think the hardest part of just being an incoming undergraduate student, no matter what your identity. Rob, do you have ideas? I mean, yeah, I agree. It's, I feel like a big process of going into school is finding your community there. And um, I don't know if I would have had the bandwidth to start an organization as an undergraduate. So, but as a graduate student, um, I, didn't see that there was a community there, so I decided to make one. <laughs> um, and so that's sort of been really good for me. Um, but I guess some advice on incoming students, I'm just starting out. I don't know, find out what you like. I, at least for me, I didn't really know what I wanted to do even coming into college. I, I like had a major because I was just like, I was good at this in high school, so I guess I'll do it now too. Um, yeah. We can always Skype or something. <laughs> I think that's great, Rob. So she had clarified it specifically for members of the LGBTQ community as an undergrad coming in and finding identity. I think you both have kind of shared a lot of strategies, but is there anything else specifically you want to share before we wrap up? Well, yeah, it, it could be that you're looking outside the university for that community. So, um, you know, in a place like Seattle, you know, there's everything from going to the bar, bar, you know, hiking, you know, there's there's sort of um, LGBTQ sort of outdoor groups and there's um, 
you know, people who knit, you know, there's, I mean, like, you know, so like, you know, I think there's your campus identity, but I think one of the things that Rob and I were both sort of sharing is that some of this means like if you're not finding a lot of allies on and, and friends on campus, there's also sort of a world out there that that's important to connect with. And just the um, way if on a Saturday night you get to be around other queer people, when you wake up on Monday morning, it's time to go back to class, you know, you filled up that bucket inside of you. You know, you feel like you, you know, you are not so alone. And so um, pay attention to it. Being lonely, being lonely is hard. And, and prioritize finding community as, you know, you're going to do your homework, you're going to study your calculus, you're going to do all these things, and you're going to block some time if you're Rob to sort of find community. Yeah, I'll just echo that. <laughs> because it is like an important part as like Lisa was talking about when she when she decided to come out where she realized it was affecting her productivity and creativity. It's It's important. And so you kind of hopefully you're able to make that a priority and make time to find a community that is there to support you. Awesome. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have, but thank you so much, Rob and Lisa, uh, for, for sharing your experiences and advice. Um, thank you all for sticking on the line. Uh, while we had some technical difficulties, just as a reminder, we'll send out a follow-up email. Um, probably early next week with a recording and a, any sort of links and um, anything part of the webinar and any um, answers to questions that we couldn't get to. Uh, but again, thank you, Rob and Lisa, um, and we will um, follow up soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for participating. Bye, all. Bye.